Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stand the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters. Uh, we had a busy week this week, actually a busy month of April, and I have no idea how we got this far in this year so quickly, but we really did. But some neat things have happened this week that I wanted to report on from here in the state of Hawaii. Um, we had the uh, High Tech Development Corporation, the parent corporation over what we do at HCAT, um, broke ground on a new facility out in Kaka'ako that uh, is going to build their incubator. They're, they're calling it a sandbox for a Hawaiian incubator where they're going to take uh, and make a space for innovators to come and occupy that have uh, as a maker space, meaning it has a place with tools and equipment where people can manufacture prototypes and things like that. It's going to have office space and facilities, copy machines, communications equipment, things like that for people to set up offices and rent small offices at a reduced price so they can get their business started without having to sink a lot into infrastructure and a lot of money into uh, capital up front to build a building or, or get office space. They can they can kind of get their business off the ground, help help new industries and new technologies in Hawaii get moving forward. So congratulations to Robbie Milton, the team at, at HDDC uh, for getting that groundbreaking going. The governor was there, had some great remarks, and uh, it was uh, it was a neat event. Most of all, the food was really good. So thanks for thanks to uh, Highway Inn for providing some great lunch for me, and um, so that was a really good event. Uh, and we got some word this week, and I, I apologize, I actually wanted to show a video, but um, we're hoping that maybe next week's even even more appropriate, because this weekend, um, the Pelly Awards are going to be announced, and that's the uh, local advertising agencies that rate um, productions, whether they're commercials or industrial films and things like that. And it appears that one of the videos that uh, we financed and, and had made for our organization as, is in line and apparently is is gonna gonna hopefully win one of the uh, awards in that in that presentation. So I wanted to bring the video and showcase it to you, but hey, we'll wait till next week and tell you whether they're one, two, or three, and uh, we'll show that video then. But for now, this week's topic here in Stan Energy Man has to do with uh, a lot of uh, what we talked about or what we visited yesterday with the groundbreaking, and that is, you know, how do we get government involved in clean energy and things like that? Um, what's the right incentives? How do we get, you know, is it, are we asking too much of the legislature to give us massive amounts of money to kickstart hydrogen or wind power or, or solar? What, what's the right vehicles and how do we, how do we navigate that, uh, that area, that political realm? And so um, we have as our guest today, Chris. I'm, I'm not going to do it, Chris. I'll wait till your name comes <laughs> up. <laughs> but uh, welcome. Thanks for uh, for being on the show today. Well, thanks for having and, me. And uh, we appreciate that uh, you've just kind of arrived back on the island, and, uh, um, but you've had a pretty extensive career doing just what I talked about, and that's uh, navigating the, the ways of uh, government, local and federal government, mm -hmm. on incentivizing uh, clean energy. Mm -hmm. And um, so tell us a little bit about uh, yourself, how you got started in it, and um, got, what got well, you back to Well, as you mentioned, I, I was born here in Honolulu, and um, I'm sure I was kicking and screaming when I was about a year and a half, two years old, and they dragged me to Pennsylvania. So I was raised in Pennsylvania. Um, my father was actually in the energy business. Mm -hmm. he, he worked for, he, he came out, he got his training in the Navy, and moved back to Pennsylvania where he grew up and started working with, at a coal-fired plant and later worked at a nuclear plant, uh, Three Mile Island, which mm. most folks have heard of. Um, so we were there for the evacuation, mm. voluntary exciting evacuation. Time. Yes, it was very exciting. Um, and so when I got out of college, I was supposed to take a year off and go back to law school. Well, that was almost 30 years ago, so I'm still taking my first year off. Um, I don't think I'll ever make it back to law school at this point, but mm. you never know. You never know. But I started working, and it was really just a job doing community organizing for environmental issues. And that led me into political campaigns. Mm. So I spent several years crisscrossing the country running and working in various parts of political campaigns, everywhere from the Northeast to Chicago to Texas to the Southeast the United States. And that then led to a job on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. I was lucky enough that one of my former candidates needed a chief of staff. He called me. I finished the race I was doing in North Carolina. About a week later, I found myself running the operation there in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. being part of not just his office operation, but he was in the Democratic leadership. 
and he was an appropriator. He later became chairman of an appropriation subcommittee. So um, kind of jumped right in at, at the highest levels, and it was, it was a blessing. Um, I got to learn a lot, do a lot, and work on a lot of issues, everything from military construction to child health care to religious liberty. Um, mm -hmm. And ended up with my boss actually being vetted by then Senator Obama as a possible vice presidential candidate. Mm. And after that, I'd kind of figured I'd done everything I could possibly do in that office in that space. And so I started looking around and um, kind of landed in the renewables sector with the American Wind Energy Association. I took the job as their top lobbyist. So I was, in, in effect, the wind industry's top lobbyist for okay. four and a half years. Um, and enjoyed it greatly. It's a fantastic space, a lot of good folks. Um, when we'd accomplished several of our goals, including renewal of the production tax credit, which is the main driver for wind, mm -hmm. and it's paired with the ITC, which drives solar and some of the other renewables, we got that renewed a couple of times, and it was sort of, okay, we've done this. We're, we're sort of on the track, so I'll look for something new to do. And due to some family issues and health issues, I took a little more time off than I wanted to. Um, but in that time frame, I sort of moved into the startup arena a little bit. Mm -hmm. D.C., Washington, D.C. has a very strong startup community. And I was lucky enough to know some folks and get invited to events and eventually ended up working with a startup that was focused not on energy but on politics. Mm. Um, and while that did not turn into the next Google, um, and I haven't been able to retire fully yet, um, it, I learned a lot from it, and I still enjoy that space. And so I'm moving back into sort of pairing those two things, renewables and the startup community, because they, they bring the, for me, they bring that energy ahead and that drive of doing campaign work, but with a business aspect to mm -hmm. it and doing something good for the world. Great. And so you, on the, on the uh, energy side, you've kind of focused in the wind area mm -hmm. primarily and, the, of course, all the... The um, what it takes to, to do the incentiv incentivizing. Yes. So you lived in Texas for a while, mm -hmm. and I happen to know because I went to Earth Day Texas maybe three years ago. Mm -hmm. That Texas has a pretty good proportion of their power generation is in wind power. Yeah, they've they've had days where they've gotten close to 100 percent on a daily basis wow. for wind um, for wind generating all all the electricity needs in Texas. And Texas, you know. Everybody has the idea that Texas is all oil and natural gas. Right. And, and, exactly. And, That's and, what surprised me. Right. Frankly, it was for a very long time. And, you know, I, I spent a lot of time when I was working in the congressional office working with natural gas. We had the, the Marcella Shale boom there right south of Dallas. And you couldn't drive from Dallas to Austin and not see about 100 new right. uh, gas wells going up. But what's, what happened in West Texas, where as oil sort of dropped a little bit, um, they really started looking for new economic drivers, and mm -hmm. so it came at the right time as wind was coming back to this country and kind of starting to grow. West Texas had the perfect resource. They needed not only electricity, but they needed the jobs. And so it started a little more on the local level than it did mm -hmm. on the state level. And you've got a lot of mayors in West Texas right. that were very, very active because it was an economic development issue that, you know, these, these wind companies brought in jobs that were paying much better mm -hmm. than anything else in those counties, and, and maybe in several counties in some of them. And so they, they brought in folks, encouraged the growth, and it is such a good source of energy. And, and as the price came down due to, you know, the growth of the industry, you know, anything grows, you can bring the price down. Um, but also the incentives, you know, especially production tax credit at the federal level, made the cost of wind energy comparable, or, compat or not, com not compatible, but competitive with, you know, natural gas, mm -hmm. with coal. We and especially right as we were phasing coal out, even in Texas started to phase coal out several years mm -hmm. ago. They, you know, we had a huge fight with Texas utilities or they wanted to put 11 power plants in Central Texas at one point, and you know, the community really pushed back against that. And so as the wind industry grew there, obviously they've just gotten more and more um, generation in place, and it's led to more jobs. Mm -hmm. um, now, Iowa still, I think, has more manufacturing jobs for wind energy than okay. any state. Making equipment. Right, and it's, you know, that's a partly a centrally lo central location issue, mm -hmm. um, and it's a transportation issue. You know, what If you bring a wind turbine in from overseas and land it at the, the port of Los Angeles, it's cheaper than a, a, a wind blade turbine made in Iowa at that moment. But once you factor in the transportation costs, I think by the time they get to the deserts out in California, the price is now equal and go, by the time you get it out of California, the U.S. made turbine blades actually it's cheaper. cheaper. So. Well, let's, let's go back a little bit and talk about, because I don't really 
I don't normally think about this, but mm -hmm. at the local level, what are the incentives that the cities and counties and municipalities bring to the table for a, a big industry like wind? What are what are some of the things well, a small a county can do? Some some of it's what any locality can do for any business. You can help with taxes. You can be a, a cheerleader, which is a large part of it, frankly, mm -hmm. is you're, you're out there advocating for your community to bring these jobs in. Right. Um, it's help with zoning and siting. Um, I know you work with the military a lot on, on hydrogen, but on, when it comes to renewals, especially like wind, where you've got a lot of military bases, where you site those turbines is, is really yeah, important due to radar. True. And so if you have the local community involved, it makes it much easier to deal with the base commanders who aren't necessarily opposed to renewables, but it's easier for them to say no to a wind project if it blocks the radars, the right. radar view than it is to actually spend the time working and, right. and setting it up correctly. So, okay. so the local community has, like in anything else, more reach than most folks give them credit for. Mm -hmm. Because those mayors and the city councilmen, those county commissioners, then move that up the chain to the state legislators and to the congressmen and the senators, mm -hmm. and they really push for policies that are going to help develop those industries in those counties. Okay. And then when you get to the state level, um, again, a bigger scope, mm -hmm. uh, state legislature to deal with, um, maybe what are some of the more effective incentives at that level or things that seem to work well at the state level? Well, you know, I don't think the incentives change drastically from a local level to a national level. I mean, you really, tax policy and the ability to work with folks. Is so waiving key. taxes or percentage waiving tax, tax breaks yes, and things little, like that? Little, little tax breaks some percentage. You can give mm -hmm. them incentives to bring a business in. You know, I mean, localities get into bidding wars all the time for businesses. Now, mm -hmm. it hasn't reached that extent with renewable energy, I don't believe, but they can do little things to make it easier. Mm -hmm. And being welcoming and friendly, you've got County A, where you've got a number of mayors and county commissioners who are actively going to these wind companies and saying, hey, we have great locations for all this, and you've got County B who's not talking to them, they're going to go mm -hmm. to County A. All I'm going to mean. interject here to bring yeah. in what I think is a, a really relevant point for the state of Hawaii. Um, and I'm not sure you're aware of this, but say the state of Hawaii comes in near the bottom of the list of business-friendly states. Mm -hmm. We come near the bottom of the list for states that are open to innovation and new technologies. We're, we're basically on the, the low end of the scale for anything to do with business development. And my experience, um, as a, I've had my own business early in my life, um, working with businesses now, working with companies that are well-established, setting up maybe hydrogen stations and thing mm -hmm. is the permitting and regulatory stuff is getting so cumbersome mm -hmm. that that's actually an inhibitor. So is there a role, especially for city, county, state level, to take away that burden? I mean, and how important is that from mm -hmm. your perspective? Because, you know, you're coming into Hawaii with fresh eyes, but I'm mm -hmm. telling you, I've, I've been beaten up by people who say, I just can't get out. It's taken me a year and a half to two years to get my permitting squared mm -hmm. away. And that's totally unacceptable. My, my financiers just won't even tolerate that. They're not gonna let me sit there and, and not pay bills for two years and, and have to wait for repay that long. Right, and, and that's the tough part with any startup business, is getting through that, you know, I think it's called the valley of death most mm -hmm. often. But I think, you know, I skipped over, obviously, the most important state level issue, which is an RPS or RES or renewable portfolio standard mm -hmm. or renewable electricity standard, depending on where you are. And there's 40 some states that have those now, we have including them. Hawaii, which has the best of 100%. So that's the biggest hurdle at a state level. If you get that, it gives the incentive and a reason for all this to come in and move forward. But the regulatory stuff is, is, is tremendously important and it's something that's often overlooked. And it's, it's, you can have the best policy, but if all the other regulations behind it, especially siting, for instance, and, right, and zoning, block those projects or make them very difficult, they go away. Right. Because companies are only gonna spend so much time and if you're looking to site a wind farm, you're a couple million dollars into it, and if you don't get zoning, well, you've lost out not only on that couple of millions, but you're going to look at you're, you're going to take two, three looks at that state again before you go yeah. back there because yeah. you're not going to continually invest a million dollars, two million dollars just to get shut down. You want to develop those those facilities. So where um, the local folks can help, meaning local elected officials, mm -hmm. state officials. They can actually help with those regulatory folks. You know, mo you know, I look at Hawaii as pretty friendly to this development. You know, we've got some, you know, some incubators here that want to do it. Yeah. The state is looking at doing some grants for mm -hmm. alternative energy. 
you know, the, the RES is in place here. So to me, it looks like a friendly environment, but I haven't had to cite a wind farm here or anything, so I don't. I would, I would agree with you. Our legislators, our governor in particular, um, are very supportive, especially of clean energy innovations. And uh, we do have, a, a, like you mentioned, a good renewable portfolio mm -hmm. standard for um, renewable energy. Um, but what I've, what I've discovered or seen is that we have elected officials and then we have in-place bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's not the elected officials that are, that are putting the drag panel out. It's below them and maybe an inability to affect those those bureaucratic processes in a, in a meaningful way mm -hmm. that are starting to drag things down. No, I, and the, that goes back to one of my core beliefs, and I found this when I went to the wind energy folks, that you know I'd worked on, the cap, on Capitol Hill more with fossil fuel folks than anything mm -hmm. else until that point. Um, but I saw a lot of the wind companies who weren't very engaged in actual lobbying or grassroots mm -hmm. work. You know, they'd send a siting team out, and then that was it, but they wouldn't work with the local community all that much. So I think what's really important for energy companies to do is to actually develop those contacts, work with the elected officials, who then in turn work with the regulatory officials. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. each state's a little different, and the federal government's a little different. But, you know, for example, we, we had, when I went to Wind Energy, um, there was a big controversy over siting of mm -hmm. wind turbine farms near military bases right. for, for, you know, basically for security and radar. And different communities dealt with it differently. Some worked with them and, and you know, and, and the base commanders and the, the military staff would work with the, the companies to cite these things properly. Um, and it happens not only just to go on a side for a second, but it, it doesn't happen just with wind companies or power sure, companies. Sure. If you're in a place, you know, Hawaii may have this, I don't know, I know Virginia Beach has had this problem with new hotels. There's a lot of military bases in the Tidewater, Virginia area. A lot of radar, well, if you put a hotel up too high or in the wrong place, you're blocking a radar view out to sea. Mm -hmm. And so the military at that point will get involved in the zoning right. and not do it. And so what you have there is some elected officials who are willing to work and help bridge the gap and work with the companies on how to cite things. Okay. And so with wind companies, what we did was we talked to the DOD, and it was, you know, uh, happenstance to be the person who was uh, the undersecretary at the time was somebody I'd worked with for a long time at Capitol Hill, so having that initial conversation was very easy, and the Obama administration was very favorable toward renewables. Now, I don't mm -hmm. know that that same attitude is there today, given the administration, but the principle is the same. You've mm -hmm. got to be able to work with the people okay. who are in charge, and you've got to actually make the outreach attempts. That okay. means companies have to sort of take two hats. They've got to have a business hat, and you've got to focus on developing your business, but when you're in a heavily regulated industry like energy is, you've got to be able to lobby okay. and work on the policy folks too. Okay. Well, we're going to take a quick break here and uh, be back with Chris in a few minutes to, to get more into depth on what happens at the federal level and maybe some of the things that we can look forward to doing here in Hawaii at that level to increase our renewable energy portfolio and the speed of light that we're going to get there. Hi everyone, I'm Andrea Gabrielli. I'm the host for Young Talents Making Way here on FinTech Hawaii. We talk every Tuesday at 11 a.m. about things that matters to tech, matter to science, to the people of Hawaii with some extraordinary guests, the students of our schools who are participating in science fair. So Young Talents Making Way every Tuesday at 11 a.m. only on FinTech Hawaii. Mahalo. Good afternoon. My name is Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green, a program on Think Tech Hawaii. We show at three o'clock in the afternoon every other Monday. My guests are specialists both from here and the mainland on energy efficiency, which means you do more for less electricity and you're generally safer and more comfortable while you're keeping dollars in your Hey, welcome back to Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii on my lunch hour, as usual. And I'm going to be heading off to the Big Island right after the show today to just kind of kick back and let my hair grow. Yeah, I mean, always let my hair grow. But um, get, just get some relaxation in because I've been stressing out at work and, and uh, everybody needs to decompress at some time. But speaking of decompressing, 
We got Chris here telling us how to decompress our government and let them free up some cash or at least get some incentives going for uh, renewable energy and uh, particularly in the state of Hawaii. So I just finished telling him that our congressional delegation, our legislature and our governor are, are really big supporters of clean energy. Our mayors are obviously uh, big supporters of clean energy. So we have a lot of support at the local and state level and even the, the congressional level but we still seem to have some hurdles to get through. So he's gonna maybe help us navigate. And, and his point, before we went on a break, to talk about what different industry incentives have to do with it in, ter in terms of uh, getting companies to get out there and actually go talk to legislatures, go talk to city council, go talk to um, the congressional offices, can make a big difference and be the intermediary between maybe DOD and uh, a contractor trying to build a hotel or put in a wind turbine or a solar array or something. So Chris, why don't we continue on that vein and, and uh, we can expand a little bit more on that. Okay. Well, I think if, if you're a company or organization looking to impact government policy, I think the key thing is to organize. Mm -hmm. And it, it sounds basic, it's, it's actually more detailed than it, than it uh, may seem to be, but it's also easier than it seems to be. Um, you need folks who are willing to pick up the phone and call their elected officials. And this is not in itself a difficult thing, but people are often sort of intimidated by that. Mm -hmm. And even though the entire reason for that office being there is to help their constituents, right. and they want to hear from their constituents. You know, yeah, I, I've I, seen I, that. I did this for, I did that for 12 years. I was the chief of staff on the Hill. We wanted to hear from our constituents all the time. We mm -hmm. sent mail to them. We did phone calls with them. We did everything we could to hear from them all the time. So um, when I encountered people that were scared to do it, it was a, you know, a new concept to me, but I was on the other side of the table for a long time. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do is be willing to take that step and take a little, take it on faith that they're actually going to want to talk to you mm -hmm. um, and pick up the phone. But you've got to kind of organize yourself before you even do that. Right. You can't just pick up the phone and say, hey, look, I've got the greatest idea for energy since the, the invention of the water wheel. Mm -hmm. You know, I need you to find me $10 million to fund it. Yeah. That's not going to work. Mm -hmm. But if you've got a good idea, you've got a company that's moving forward, you can talk to, you've got to get involved with the, the organizations that are already doing this, right. the, the various associations, wind, solar, there are some bigger renewable groups, um, and they can help direct you, but you've got to be part of the team to do that because mm -hmm. they can't do it all themselves. They need individuals to help too. They mm -hmm. can't just hire one or two guys to sit in D.C. and do it. So, and then you've got to have your ducks in a row for what you want. And so it's, it's easier in some ways to push big policy because you're not asking for something directly for your company, but if you want to change the, the tax structure and mm -hmm. you get a coalition together, you can push for it. You want a diverse coalition, you want not just people from that industry if you can do it, but find other folks that benefit from it. You know, mm -hmm. with renewables, it was always the pairing of the production tax credit and the investment tax credit because different industries in the renewable sector use those differently. So we all came together um, and, and created a coalition, and we added a lot of folks that weren't normally thought of as part of that. A lot mm -hmm. of the tech companies, the Googles, um, even Walmart, that were using um, renewable energy. And then play, things like the National Farmers Union and the American Farm Bureau because it impacts their constituencies mm -hmm. as well. And it allows those groups to reach members that they maybe wouldn't. And what you want to do is when you've got a friendly delegation like Hawaii does, you don't need to spend a lot of time convincing them, but you need to help them help you by figuring out ways to get to other members of Congress. Um, and you know, the state legislature here, legis legislature here is sort of one, almost one party. There aren't very mm -hmm. many Republicans, so it doesn't quite work the same here. But you've got to reach out to the other side and focus on how do we bring more people to this than mm -hmm. just the, this coalition that we already have. And you've got to avoid falling into that trap of just talking to people who are already on your side. Right. That is very easy to do. Right. And it's, you know, it's easier to pull in somebody who's a big fan of renewables to come talk to you. It's actually a better thing to reach out to that person who's on the margins um, and who maybe normally you wouldn't talk to, but there's a reason to talk to them. You know, there's you know, if you look at wind energy, for example, the vast majority, I think, I want to say 70% of the wind projects in the country are in Republican districts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the wind industry, industry spent a lot of time reaching out to those Republicans mm -hmm. because we needed them. 
um, you know, especially on the federal level where they're sort of in charge of all three branches of government right now. Um, say that House, Senate, White House, but um, so you've got to reach out across the aisle and pull in folks that normally maybe you wouldn't agree with on any other issue on the planet. On the wind energy. You right. Know. On the renewables, on the wind energy, whatever it is, if you can get them on that, that's all you need. Okay. You don't have to worry about their other policy positions. Okay, well, what you've explained so far is kind of encouraging because it appears that we're kind of down that road now. We, we have, um, I think, bipartisan support for clean energy in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, pretty confident of that, even though, like you say, the Republican voice may be fairly small. Um, it's there to support. It's, it, that's a easily supported bipartisan issue in the state. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my ex personal experience in my previous life in, in the National Guard, we were unusual in the DOD sense that we were allowed to go talk to our congressman anytime we wanted, and we did. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned from my, my uh, leadership before me that, um, that it was important to go talk to Congress, um, not to be shy about it, but to not waste their time to go in there with the very specific uh, mm -hmm. tight briefings that were, were not long and wordy and, and got right to the point. Um, and what, what was it going to do for the people of Hawaii? What was it going to do for the U.S. government? What was it going to do, you know, to protect us or whatever? And at the end, what's the ask? What are you asking this congressman or this, this senator to do? Sir, you're on the Appropriations Committee or sir, you're Ma'am, you're, you're on the, the Ways and Means Committee, or, you know, and we need you to do this to help us get this piece of legislation for or, or that. And, and I think we have some groups together that are, that are starting to, to pull those strings really well in terms mm -hmm. of tightening up their briefings and making good presentations. And we're getting some headway there. But I have to share a story with you. Um, when I, I first met the State Department of Transportation had the former one, um, Ford Fujikami. Um, I met him the day he was uh, met his Senate confirmation in the state Senate mm -hmm. in the governor's office with the governor's chief of staff. And I told him what we wanted to do. And he said, Stan, you need to get your consortium together and you need to do And he started explaining just what you said. And I go, you're looking at the consortium. It's me. And that was the problem. It was only me. It was not me with all the other stakeholders it could be. And so we started trying to solve that, and it, it seems to be moving forward. Well, and it, you know, when you organize, especially on a political issue, there's strength in numbers. The more folks you have, the better you are, and the more you can reach. And, the, you know, one of the things that people tend to overlook, though, is when they want to reach out to a member of Congress, um, you've got to remember that members of Congress are elected to represent their district only. Right, right. So, you know, and I had to discuss this often with when CEOs. Um, it's nice that you're the CEO, but you live in New York. The yeah. guy in Kansas doesn't really care what you think so much. I mean, you've got industry there and jobs. What I'd rather have is the person who does maintenance on the wind turbines of Kansas yeah. come up. Fly him up to D.C. and let's have him talk to the senator. And the same thing works in the state legislature. So, yeah. Well, believe it or not, we've kind of hit the end of our 30-minute block, oh. which I promised you would go by in a flash. And it did. When I talked to you, and it did. So but, um, can you thanks, spell Chris. my name yet? No, I can't spell your name. I'm okay. sorry. And, and if I tried, you'd just get mad at me. But um, it's been a pleasure having you on, Chris. And it's great working with your wife. We met mm -hmm. and talked to her. She's working up in, in Manoa. And um, I think she's going to be a great fit in that organization. And uh, look forward to meeting your dog. Someday, <laughs> we've got the whole story yeah, in your If dog. you want to keep all your fingers, it may not be a bad idea. <laughs> but thanks for uh, being on the show today and, and giving us some insight, uh, really, from a perspective that we don't normally get here, and that's the, the big um, political perspective from lobbying side and everything else. And we'll have to have you back on after you've gotten more, more feelers out here in Hawaii, <clears throat> and we'll, we'll get you back on to talk more about uh, how to move us forward. So until next week, Friday. Um, Stan Energy Man signing off here. Thanks to Cindy and Robert here in the studio for pulling it all together and keeping me on track. Aloha.